Welcome back. This is section 4.3, logarithmic functions. So in this section, we're going to look at, first off, what is a logarithmic function? Um, what are the properties of logarithms? How can we use that to actually evaluate logarithms um, and then eventually help us to actually solve some problems? And we'll look at some graphs of logarithmic functions as well. All right, so first off, the definition of a logarithmic function. So we're going to let a be a positive number, but a cannot be equal to 1. The logarithmic functions with a base a denoted by base a log is defined this way. So we're going to say that the base a log of x equals y means that a to the y power is equal to x. So these are equivalent statements now. So notice that we can actually take a logarithmic function, a logarithmic equation, and rewrite it in its exponential form and just rewrite it as an exponential equation. Really all we're doing is we're taking the base of our logarithm, we're raising it to this power over here, and it's going to be equal to whatever value is inside the logarithm. Okay, so if we have a base a log of x equals y, that just means that a to the y power is equal to x. And so that's going to be the first thing we're going to do now is to actually rewrite some of these logarithms in their exponential forms so that we can think about how to evaluate them. Right? Now, in general, that means that the base a log of x is the exponent to which a base of a must be raised to give us x. Okay, so in other words, this means that a to the base a log of x is going to be equal to x. That's what that last statement right there says. And we'll get to those properties a little bit later. Okay, but that's going to be one of those properties that's going to help us to actually simplify things. All right, so we've got logarithmic and exponential forms are equivalent here. So what we want to do is rewrite each one of these in its exponential form. Okay, so. This first one here, and I've actually got a typo, this should be a four, sorry. Okay, so we've got the base 10 log of 10,000 is equal to four. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do here is just rewrite it using that strategy that I just showed you on the last slide. So we're gonna take our base, we're gonna raise it to this power over here, and that should equal whatever's inside of our logarithm. So we can say that 10 to the fourth power is equal to 10,000. So the next one here, same thing. We're taking our base, we're raising it to this power here. It should be equal to this value inside the logarithm. So we can rewrite this as two to the third power is equal to eight. All right, then we're gonna take two, we're gonna raise it to the negative three power, and that's gonna be equal to one eight. So two to the negative three equals one over eight. And finally, this last one here, we've got some variables, but we're still going to do it exactly the same way. We'll have 5 to the r is equal to s. 5 to the r equals s. So again, that shows now that all of these logarithmic forms and exponential forms are equivalent to each other. So if we can rewrite one as the other, then it might actually help us to solve some of these problems. All right, so now we're going to actually try to evaluate. So what we're thinking about here, again, is 10 to some power, and I'm just going to put a little x over here just so we know what we're actually trying to find, should be equal to the number inside the logarithm. So I could rewrite this in exponential form as 10 to the x is equal to 1,000. So what I'm really trying to find here is what is that exponent that I would have to raise 10 to to give us 1,000? Well, shortcut here, right, is because it's one with three zeros, I know that 10 to the third power is going to give us that, right? So 10 to the third power should equal 1,000. Therefore, x has to be equal to three. So the base 10 log of 1,000 is equal to three this time. Do the same thing with this next one, put an x over here. So this time we have 2 to the x is equal to 32. So we just have to figure out what value would I have to raise 2 to to give us 32. In this case, 2 to the fifth power should be equal to 32. Therefore, that x value is equal to 5. So the base 2 log of 32 
is equal to five now. All right, same thing on the next one, put an X. So 10 to the X power is equal to 0 0.1. In this case, it's probably better to think about this as a fraction, just so it's easier to figure out where that 10 is going. This is really 10 to the X equals 1 tenth. Right, so 0.1 is just 1 tenth. So now we can see that we actually have a 10 in our denominator, which means I'm going to need a negative exponent to move that 10 down to the bottom. In this case, this is just going to be 10 to the negative 1 equals 1 over 10. So that X value this time is just a negative 1. So we have the base 10 log of 0.1 is equal to negative 1. Right. And then finally, put an X. So we're going to have 16 to the X power equals 4. Now this time we don't have a fraction, so it's not going to be a negative exponent. So we have to think about what we would have to do to 16 to give us 4. Well, I know that the square root of 16 is equal to 4, and I know another way to write square roots is fractional exponents, right? So I can do this as 16 to the 1 half power equals 4, because that's the same thing as the square root of 16 equals 4, which means that the base 16 log of 4 is equal to 1 half this time. So we just have to keep in mind here, right, if we end up with fractions, we know we're going to have negative exponents. If we're dealing with some type of root, square roots, cube roots, fourth roots, whatever, we know we're going to have to have a fractional exponent instead. All right, now some properties of logarithms. The base A log of one is always gonna be equal to zero, no matter what the base is. And the reason for that, remember we could rewrite this in exponential form, A to the zero equals one is what this would be, and any value to the zero power should give us one. Okay, so any base log um, of one should always equal zero, no matter what the base is. Now the next property says that the base A log of A is equal to one. And again, the reason for that is that A to the first power is always gonna be equal to A no matter what. So if I were to rewrite that in exponential form, we know if the base and the number inside match up, that's always gonna be equal to one because that would have to be your exponent. You know, the next one here, very similar to the last one, except now we have a different exponent. So we have a to the x equals a to the x is what that says. Okay, so if we were to rewrite that in exponential form, and that's why in this case, if these numbers match up, then we can just take the exponent here as our value for the logarithm. Right, and then finally, if, if you were to switch these and put the base a here and the base of a here, we kind of already mentioned this before, that this is the exponent that you would have to raise it to to give you x. And so a to the log base a of x is just going to be equal to x now. So again, those are four properties of logarithms that if we can keep those in mind, it's going to help us to actually simplify a lot of things and solve some of these problems. All right, so let's take a look here at example three. We've got a base five log of one. Okay, well, remember we said no matter what the base is, if we have a one in there, the exponent's gonna have to be a zero. We would say this is equal to zero now because five to the zero power would equal one. Now the next one, our base matches up with this value inside the logarithm. And so this one's gonna be equal to one because five to the first power would be equal to five. This next one here, we've got a base of five, we've got a five inside, but this time we have an exponent, and so we said this should just be equal to that exponent because five to the eighth would be equal to five to the eighth. And our last one here, fives match up, so we can just take the value inside this logarithm and the exponent, and so this one's going to be equal to 12. All right, so now we want to sketch the graph of base 2 log of x. All right, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a table of values here. We're going to substitute some values in and see what this is equal to. So I'm going to create a table x and f of x.
As always, we probably want to do some negative values and some positive values okay, just to give us an idea of what this is going to be. So keep in mind here, we probably want to try to keep values that are going to give us nice integer answers so that we can actually plot them pretty easily on our graph. So I know that values that I could put in here now are going to be like two to some power. And the reason for that is I have that property that says if the base of the logarithm and the number inside match up, then my answer is just going to be whatever the exponent is. Okay, so what I'm going to do over here now is I'm going to start with like two to the negative three power, because then I know that the base two log of two to the negative three should just be equal to negative three. Well, two to the negative three, remember, would be one over two to the third. So this is really one over eight. And then I can do the same thing with other values now. I'm gonna do two to the negative two, the base two log of two to the negative two should be equal to negative two. Again, I can rewrite this as 1 over 2 to the second power, or just 1 over 4. And then we'll do 2 to the negative 1. Following that same logic now, this should just be equal to negative 1. And this right here is just 1 over 2 to the first, or 1 half. And now 2 to the 0 power. Anything to the zero is one, but the base two log of two to the zero now is gonna be zero. So we get zero for that one. And let's do some positive exponents here. So the base two log two to the first is gonna be equal to one. That's just two. And we'll do two squared, base two log of two to the second is gonna be two. That's actually a value of four. And finally, we'll do two to the third power. So the base two log of two to the third should be equal to three. And that X value is actually equal to eight now. So by choosing those values to be two to some power, that easily gives me the f of x value so that I get nice integer answers, and then I can actually just calculate the x values based off of those exponents. Okay, so now I have a table of values. My first point in this case, when I sketch this graph, is going to be at one eighth negative three. So my I'm going to make one way over here just because I know I've got some fractions to fill in here. So I'm going to go to one eighth and then I'm going to go down to negative three. Must be somewhere right in here. So one eighth, a little bigger than zero. Then we're going to go to one fourth and that's going to have a value of negative two. So now I'm going over a little bit further to the right and then I'm going to be down here at negative two. When I get to one half, I should be at negative one. So that's halfway between zero and one. It'll be right here. And my next point is one zero. So that's actually my x intercept. So one zero is right here. And then we have a point at two one. So we'll go over two up one. It's going to give us a point right here. And then finally, we have a point at 8, 3. Well, I didn't make my graph large enough to actually go all the way over to 8, but just know that by the time, oh, sorry, I could go to 4, 2. So 4 would be the next value over here. And I would do 2. So that's going to be right on the edge of that screen there. And then the last value would be at 8, 3, which again would be off my screen because I would need to go over to the right 8 units. Okay, we can at least get an idea here of what this graph is going to look like. So notice if I connect these now, it's going to be a nice smooth curve like this. And notice that as I get closer to zero along the y-axis here, 
I'm never going to actually get anything that's equal to zero or anything that's negative because these negative f of x values just represent fractions in terms of the x. I'm just getting smaller and smaller, closer and closer and closer to zero, but it's never actually going to get there. Okay, so I'm going to have a graph that looks something like this now. And some properties then of this graph. Notice here that our x-intercept is at 1, 0. For any basic logarithmic function, that's always going to be the case because any base to the 0 power should be equal to 1. And so we know in this case that 1, 0 has to be a point on that graph unless there's some kind of transformation. The other thing that we've got going on here that's always going to be the case is we're going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So along the y-axis, x equals zero, that's our vertical asymptote for this graph. So again, no matter what the base is, in this case the base was two, but no matter what that number is, our basic shape of our logarithmic function graph is going to have these two rules, right? We're going to have an x-intercept at one zero, we're going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero, and it's going to have that basic shape to it. And the base is just going to change how fast or slow it grows as you go out to the right-hand side. Right, now, one thing we do want to point out here is the relationship between this graph and the exponential function graphs that we looked at in the last section. Okay, so keep in mind, I'm going to change colors here just so we can look at it as a separate graph. So remember with our exponential function, let's say we were looking at something like y equals 2 to the x power, just to keep the base the same, right, because it's both a base of 2. Remember we said the y-intercept of that graph now is going to be 0, 1. And we also know that we have a horizontal asymptote along the x-axis at y equals 0. And so an exponential function, 2 to the x, would look something like this now. So if we look at those two graphs, we can see then that one is actually just a reflection over the line y equals x. If I were to draw this line in here now, goes through 0, 0, has a slope of 1. So that exponential function 2 to the x is just a reflection of the base 2 log of x over the line y equals x. And if you remember back to the previous unit, we said that whenever you have a reflection over the line y equals x, that means that these are inverses of each other. So these two functions are inverses. So in general, the exponential function and the logarithmic function are inverse functions of one another. We can actually use one to undo the other. Okay, So that's why this is going to be useful when we actually go to start solving equations. Because they are inverses now, if I want to get rid of an exponential function, I can use a logarithm. If I need to get rid of a logarithmic function, I can actually use exponents. All right, so now we're going to look at some transformations of these log functions. Okay, so we just looked at the base 2 log of x, and now we're going to actually look at this g of x function. Notice what we've got here is this negative out front. Okay, so again, I'm going to list out my transformation first, then we'll look at the graph. So if I put a negative in front of a function in general, right, the same transformations we've been looking at, this is going to give us a reflection over our x-axis. So we're going to take that parent function, the base 2 log of x that we just looked at, and we're going to reflect it over the x-axis now. Well, if we do that, the x-intercept was at 1. That's not going to change, right, because that point reflected over the x-axis does not move. Now, all the stuff that was at the bottom is actually going to get reflected up to the top. 
So now instead of approaching the y-axis as I go towards negative infinity, now I'm going to be approaching the y-axis as I go towards positive infinity along the y there. And then all that stuff that was above the x as I go out towards positive infinity on the x, now that's going to get reflected down here. And so I'm going to get something that looks like this now. So this right here would be a basic sketch, right? So not trying to get too technical or too precise, okay, but that would be the reflection of the base 2 log of x over the x-axis now. All right, now the next one here, we've got the base 2 log of negative x. So remember the negative on the inside now is also going to be a reflection this reflection is going to be over the y-axis instead. So now when we actually sketch this graph, that point that was at 1, 0 now, if we reflect it over the y-axis, is actually going to get shifted over here to negative 1, 0 instead. And then remember the basic shape of our base 2 log of x was going up and to the right. So now it's actually going to come in like this, and it's going to be going down and approaching our horizontal asymptote from the left-hand side instead. All right, now that we've got our graphs, let's go back and talk about domain, range, and asymptotes for each one of these. So for this first one, our domain, notice here, is always bigger than zero, right? We don't have any x values that are less than zero, and zero itself isn't included because that's an asymptote. It's never actually going to get to zero. We're going to say our domain goes from zero to positive infinity with a parentheses on the zero because it's not included. Now the range, we look at all the y values, this thing is going to go all the way up to positive infinity and it's going to go all the way down to negative infinity if I go out far enough to the right. And so our range here would be all real numbers, negative infinity, to positive infinity. Right, and then our asymptote this time, if you notice we've got the vertical asymptote here. And it's still along the y-axis, so it's still going to be x equals 0. So giving us that reflection, we still have an asymptote, even though it's approaching towards positive infinity instead of negative infinity, the vertical asymptote is still x equals 0. Okay, now let's look at our h of x graph. So again, we're looking first at domain. This time, all of our x values are on the left-hand side of 0. So we're going to go from negative infinity zero and again there's that asymptote at zero so it's never going to get there and so we're going to use parentheses on the zero our range just like before is going to be all real numbers okay, because this goes all the way down to negative infinity and it's going to eventually get to positive infinity if i go far enough out to the left so this is all real numbers and then finally our asymptote again we have another vertical asymptote here and it's still going to be at x equals 0, even though I'm approaching from the opposite side. Now, in this case, remember, with logarithmic functions, we're only going to have that vertical asymptote. We're not going to have a horizontal asymptote. Just like the exponential function only had a horizontal and no vertical, now the logarithmic is going to have a vertical and no horizontal. All right, so let's do some other transformations here. So this next one, we've got 2 plus the base 5 log of x. Now, in general, look at our parent function, base 5 log of x. It does not really matter what that base is. We said that that's always going to give us the same basic shape graph. So one thing that I know for sure is that I have an x-intercept at 1. I have my vertical asymptote at 0. And so my parent function is going to look something like this. All 
All right, now, if we do 2 plus that, that means we're actually taking that base 5 log of x and we're shifting it up 2 units. Transformation here, shift up 2 units. If we sketch our g of x graph this time. That point that was at 1, 0 is going to get shifted up 2 units. So it's going to be up here now. Now, everything else about this graph is pretty much going to stay the same. Obviously, it's going to cross this axis somewhere before we get to 1, right? And so if I sketch this now, it looks something like this. And it's going to go up and to the right like this. So again, I'm just taking that parent function, base 5 log of x, shifting everything up two units, and so we're going to get something around that graph g of x there. Right, now let's talk about domain range and asymptote, because they asked for all three of those things. So our domain. Well, notice here my asymptote hasn't moved, right? I'm still approaching zero from that right-hand side, and so we're still going to have a domain that's from zero to positive infinity, not including the zero. The range is still going to be all real numbers because I'm still approaching all y values as I go to zero or positive infinity in this case. And then the asymptote, we still have that vertical asymptote, and it still hasn't moved. It's still at x equals zero in this case because all I did was shifted the graph up two units. All right, now let's look at h of x. Okay, so this time we're taking the base 10 log of x minus 3. Well, again, parent function here would be the base 10 log of x. It's going to have an x-intercept at 1. It's going to have our asymptote, and it's going to go up and to the right. Okay. Again, very similar to the base 5 log of x, very similar to the base 2 log of x. Um, we know those two things for sure. The only thing that changes as I change that base is how fast or slow it grows as I go up and to the right. All right, so now if we do x minus 3 on the inside, though, remember this is going to give us a shift to the right three units. Now, if we come over here and sketch our graph, that point that's at 1, 0 is actually getting shifted right three units. So 1, 2, 3, 4 now is where that point's going to be. If we shift everything to the right three units, that's also going to shift the asymptote. Okay, So my asymptote would have been at 0. It's going to get shifted over three units. So now I'm actually going to have an asymptote right here. And so then my graph is just going to do this. It's going to come up and go through that point, and then it's going to go up and to the right. All right, so now when we talk about domain, since everything got shifted over to the right three units, notice here three is that starting point, and then it goes out towards infinity. And again, the three is not included because that is our asymptote this time. Now the range is not affected. So our range here is still from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then our vertical asymptote, we just said, gets shifted over to the right three units. So instead of x equals zero, it's now x equals three. All right, now, common logarithms. So any log with a base of 10 is called the common logarithm. And so instead of having to write base 10 every time, we can actually just write it as the log of x, like this. Okay, so whenever you see log x understood base of 10, we don't have to write the 10. All right, so if you notice, if you look at your calculator, okay, there is a log key on your calculator that log key is automatically a base 10 log, okay? So you can't actually go in 
Some calculators now will allow you to change that base. And if you just press the log key in general, it's gonna automatically give you a base 10 log. Right, now, example eight, the perception of loudness, B, which we're gonna measure in decibels, of a sound with um, physical intensity, I, which is measured in watts per meter squared, is given by this function here. Now, what we want to do in this case um, is we want to figure out um, the decibel level where the intensity is 100 times that of I sub zero. So in other words, we're going to say that I is equal to 100 times I sub zero. I don't have this on the screen, okay, but if you look in the textbook, you can see that's what the problem was actually asking us to find. So what we're gonna do in this case is we're actually gonna substitute 100 I sub zero in place of our intensity I in this, and we're gonna solve for B. We're gonna find the decibel level. We're gonna say that B is equal to 10 times the log. And instead of I now, I'm gonna have 100 times that initial intensity over the initial intensity. So notice when I do this now, the I sub zero should cancel out because I'm dividing one by the other, so I can cancel those out. So I'm really just left with our decibel level is equal to 10 times the log of 100. So if I can figure out what the log of 100 is now, then I can actually find this decibel level. Well, remember, this just means base 10 log of 100. Whenever there's no base, it's a common log. Base is automatically 10. So I just need to know what would I need to raise 10 to to give us 100? Well, 10 to the second power is equal to 100. So that means that this base 10 log of 100 is equal to 2. So now in place of that, I can say this is just 10 times 2. Or in other words, our decibel level here is going to be 20 decibels. So decibel levels are an example, a real-world example of where we use logarithms. Okay, so the decibel scale is actually a logarithmic scale. Um, where that intensity level of the loudness is actually in base 10 form. Okay, so it's going to be like 10 to the first, 10 to the second, 10 to the third. Um, every time you go up like that, you're actually multiplying by an additional 10 every time the decibel level goes up. And now natural logarithms. Okay, so we just talked about the common logarithm. Now the natural logarithm is gonna have a base of E instead. Now the notation we're gonna use for that is LN. Okay, so notice that's an L, not an I. Okay, so LN of X, natural log of X, means that we have a base of E now. So instead of always having to write log base E, if we want a base of E, we can just write natural log instead. Now it's gonna have those same four properties as the other logs that we looked at, okay, because now our base just happens to be E, but the natural log of one equals zero. And again, that's because E to the zero power would be equal to one. The next one here, again, the base is E. So this tells us that E to the first power is equal to E. The next one here, again, the base is E. So E to the X equals E to the X. And then finally, this base up here is an E, and so those cancel out, and that's why we can just take whatever values inside that natural log here. So anytime you see a natural log, just understand that its base is automatically E, just like a common log automatically has a base of 10. All right, so if we want to evaluate these now, we're going to use those properties we just saw. So again, the base here is E, and then we've got E to the eighth power. And so this time we can just take whatever the exponent is, and so this should be equal to eight. Now this next one we probably want to rewrite first just to help us think about what it is. 
I'm going to write this as e to the negative 2 power. Just because we have e squared in the denominator, I can write that as a negative exponent. Now we have a natural log has a base of e to, and then e to some power. So again, we can just take whatever this exponent is right here. And so this should be equal to negative 2. All right, now this last one, we've got a natural log of 5. Well, notice I don't have any e's anywhere inside this natural log other than what the base is automatically. There's no way that I can do this by hand and simplify. So this is when we would go to the calculator, we would just get a decimal value. Okay, so on your calculator, you should have a natural log key. So make sure you know where that is. We're just going to take the natural log of 5 here. I'm going to round this to four decimal places. So this will be 1.6094. So anytime it's not a nice exact value um, and you need a decimal, right, you would just go to your calculator, put in natural log of 5 in this case, and that would give us our decimal. All right, example 10. Now we want to find the domain of this function. So we got natural log of 4 minus x squared. So if you think about all the logarithms that we've looked at so far, all of their domains have always been greater than zero, right? So just the basic log function in general always had the asymptote at zero, and everything was to the right of that. That tells me that everything inside of a logarithm, no matter what its base is now, needs to be greater than zero, strictly greater than zero, not greater than or equal to, because that asymptote is not included. So what I can say here is that this four minus x squared has to be greater than zero. That's always gonna be the case, no matter what type of logarithm you're looking at, everything inside the log needs to be greater than zero. Now we've gotta solve this. So I'm gonna factor first. We're going to have 2 minus x times 2 plus x must be greater than 0. Now, because this is a quadratic inequality, at this point, I'm going to need to find those two numbers and create a number line so I can test some points and see where it's positive and negative. I'm going to do 2 minus x equals 0, 2 plus x equals 0. This one here is going to give us 2 equals x if I add the x. This one's going to give us x equals negative 2 if I subtract the 2. Okay, so now I'm going to do my number line. We're going to have a negative 2, and we're going to have a positive 2. Now I'm going to choose values in each of my intervals. I'm going to plug them in, see if it's positive or negative. So for this interval down here, we'll go with negative 3. I'm going to substitute into this factored form up here to see is it positive or negative. First, we're going to have 2 minus negative 3 times 2 plus negative 3. Well, 2 minus negative 3 becomes addition, so that's going to be a positive. 2 plus a negative 3 is a negative 1, so that's going to be a negative. So a positive times a negative now should give us a negative down here. Now we need something between negative 2 and 2, so I'll go with 0 and substitute that in. We're going to have 2 minus 0 times 2 plus 0. 2 minus 0 is a positive. 2 plus 0, also positive, and a positive times a positive should give us a positive in between negative 2 and 2 now. And finally, we need something bigger than 2, so I'll go with 3. It gives us 2 minus 3 times 2 plus 3. 2 minus 3 is going to be a negative. 2 plus 3 is going to be a positive. Negative times a positive should give us a negative. Now remember, we wanted this to be greater than 0, meaning we want values that are positive. That means I'm only looking at this interval right here. So when I find the domain of this function, it's only going to be values between negative 2 and 2. And because it's strictly greater than 0, not greater than or equal to, I don't want to include those endpoints, so my domain this time is just going to be from negative 2 to 2, both with parentheses.
All right, so that's all we've got for this section. As always, send me questions as you have them in WebAssign. Come see me during student hours if you need to. Have a great day, and I will see you next time.